Hello and welcome to the Linux Lads, the Linux Lads Christmas edition featuring uh, Wayne and Mark of the Binary Times. Um, as usual, I'm Shane. And I'm just about to open up a can of beer, so <laughs> I'm Connor. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Beerless Mike. Beerless Mike, and we're joined by Wayne and Mark. How are you? Really good, lads. Thanks for having us back. You're welcome. Grand, yeah, indeed. Um, thanks for having us back. You're yeah. very welcome. We are very happy that you made it here. Got yeah. to share this. Christmas. Yeah, consi- considering yeah that you've ended um, the Binary Times a few months ago for anyone who doesn't know. So uh, it's great. One last hurrah. The annual tradition. <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah before we get into it today um, we wanted to talk about that competition that we discussed last time um, where we were going to give away a copy of Conan Exiles um, but we didn't get too many entries <laughs> um, by too many so, entries he means a big fat zero yeah. <laughs> so yeah we're, well, we well, we decided to change it up a bit to make it a bit more tempting that's because it was on Twitter <laughs> probably because it was on Twitter uh, <laughs> Well, I suppose that's because marketing just doesn't work ever. Marketing a hoax. <laughs> we did mention but it. We the, did mention it on the uh, podcast, but yeah. The new kind of competition now we've changed it to a prize of uh, Cyberpunk twenty seventy seven. So that's all the rage nowadays. Um, everyone's talking about that game. So as usual, the rules are you have to have Steam or GOG, G O G, good old games, whatever you want to call it. Uh, you can have either of those uh, if you want. Um, you can follow us on Twitter uh, and use hashtag CyberpunkLads. Or you can email show at linuxlads.com with CyberpunkLads as the subject. Uh, so, you know, because we didn't want to keep it just on Twitter, basically. <laughs> um, the entries will be put into a spreadsheet and a random number generator will pick the winner. So there's no dis- or disadvantage or advantage to getting the entry in early. We are not doing a spreadsheet. Who said that? That's that's oh, a rumor, and it's a, that's, that's, that's a slander. <laughs> what are we accountants? No, we are. That has, that has to be. I think um, a CSV D- file then. A DM, a DM <laughs> who's uh, donating kindly to uh, the, the the game actually suggested a PowerShell because that's his thing, right? He's the PowerShell on Linux guy, so he suggested a random generator function on that uh, on uh, PowerShell, and we should do that. I've had a look, and it's uh, oh, extremely okay. Simple, so. so. Can, once we get past uh, Mike interrupting, uh, the <laughs> deadline for the entries is midnight Dublin time on the 23rd and the winner will be contacted on the 24th. So that gives uh, people plenty of time if they uh, plan on um, u- ha- using the the copy of the game for their kid for Christmas Day or something like that. Or it's an early Christmas present for yourself. So uh, that's the deadline. Yeah, despite um, Mike's objection, we'll put them into some kind of um, spreadsheet on... Some kind of tabular data format. Yeah. <laughs> and some kind of magical so data. You actually grid. have to do that, right? You just need to you just need to order them with line numbers and you do a random generator function that will tell you which line number won. Um, um, so anyway. so Mike has, has just volunteered to do all of that. Yeah, it's 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 simple. <laughs> I'd rather That's just do a Vim that. script, Mike. Uh, well, uh, I, I we said PowerShell <laughs> because the but uh, I'd rather do then that, that than have us, uh, you oh, know, have, it have, was, us it was, have our reputation was, no, was, destroyed it, by us using spreadsheet for this. It was it was in the interest of impartiality because some people say, "Oh, I don't trust your random number generator or or something." And you would trust uh, LibreOffice random generator more than PowerShell's or, or the Linux uh, random function? I don't know. I have uh, this no debate can to go on forever. Any of them, but to be honest, like, uh, to be honest, yeah, ra- computers don't do random really, so we should probably we it would be more random if we picked it up out of a hat, but then just <laughs> nah. <laughs> when we did competitions on the binary times, we did it the same way they did them on Father Ted. You can't go further. Than that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, anyway, we'll 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 figure it we out sh- we sh- and uh, yeah. we'll we'll pick a number and we'll pick a winner and the winner will be contacted. So uh, we'll figure it out amongst ourselves how we're going to do it. So next up, uh, something slightly slightly less controversial, I should say, is uh, Microsoft apologizes for feature criticized as workplace surveillance. So uh, I think we all heard about this earlier in the week about um, Microsoft basically uh, having a, 
a metric uh, productivity score and it was basically monitoring employee work, employee productivity and assigning a score and they're saying this was like tantamount to workplace surveillance so i think they rolled back on it now and they you know they're they're apologizing for doing it now what do you what do you think of this i hope this will not become obviously again it's a company and as you know within the within the space of the laws they can do whatever and the employers can do whatever and many employers would like to survey like do some kind of a uh you know close surveillance on their employees especially since everybody's at home and i hope and this probably cannot be legislated but i hope that this uh, backpedaling that uh, Microsoft had to do, I, f I hope that's going to be the norm. So that, you know, I hope it's going to be very much thrown upon uh, outside of really bad industries like, you know, uh, uh, I, I know, I, I, I know, oh, I knew of something like this being done in a call center 10 years ago. And I'm pretty sure there's like places where this is the norm, but I hope that in like wider scope of uh, imp like of uh, workplaces and uh, people working this is not going to be acceptable behavior like you should it's it's obviously it's a bad management technique for starters you cannot if you if you try to do that that already saying that you're a really crappy manager and uh, like yeah the, as, i don't know as for microsoft i think they might have but they said that they had some good intentions that was not intended to be used this way i think and that uh, like whatever, I don't know. They might be right. They might be true. They might be not. But uh, I hope, like, basically, we will be able, like, as a society, we will refuse these things. I've seen some of the reactions to this story, and some of the more hardline um, privacy and security advocates were saying, "Oh, it's." Uh, it's Microsoft. Sure, their entire operating system is is getting um sending off uh, information and metrics in relation to your usage. So why is this a surprise to you? And it's, I mean, people know that that's going on, or at least you should know if you're running Windows ten, and you should uh, you can take uh, steps to mitigate that to kind of uh, slow down the the. Uh, torrent of information that's that's going uh, to the Microsoft servers, but the whole, this was the whole thing was they didn't know that this was going on. They didn't know that all of this information was being sent up, and uh, I don't know how they found out. Uh, if, uh, I I haven't read too much in depth into the article to, to see how the employees actually found out about this, but they did find out, and yeah, it's it, it it's. In some aspects, unfortunately, that this does not surprise me about certain aspects of the Microsoft Corporation is that I was like, oh, whether I was like, yeah, unfortunately, that's kind of meets my expectations of how shitty they are there. Um, but it like this, this shit is just not honest. Like, like, like I'm, I'm sure they, they, what they're doing is they're literally, they're dehumanizing the, uh, their, um, employees any company that implements this and from microsoft's point of view they're uh, deemed humanizing their their customers uh, is the whole thing of you're a source of information this information is useful for us because uh, we can monetize it or we can use it to improve our, our products or whatever let's load like not once did they think uh oh um I'm being my measurement as employees being um, put against this arbitrary scale of uh, freaking Debbie in accounts replied to 50 emails this week and I only replied to 10. Does that mean that Debbie in accounts is a better employee than me? No, it means that her job is different. <laughs> and it's like that you're, you're, you're worth. Uh, as an employee should not be against those kind of statistics but and for someone who who i wouldn't say i deal with uh upper level management but i i kind of do um uh in it not indirectly because i deal with them through my manager but i there'd be times where you'd say things to your manager and my manager is a nice guy like i know that he takes feedback on board and then 
upper management will just make a decision as if that that was not uh, they were going to go ahead with whatever they wanted to do anyway and your feedback means absolutely fuck all to them so from upper management point of view they're like oh yeah yeah uh connor only replied to 10 emails this week where debbie replied to 50 that means that debbie is a better employee it's like but they're different jobs <laughs> And they're like, there's different constraints, and there's different. Uh, and, uh, yeah, so what if uh, some two people doing this exact same role, like forget about comparing two different roles, two people ex- com- uh, doing the exact same role, so what if one replies to 15 emails, the other replies to 20? Does that mean that the person who replied to 20 emails is a better employee? I mean, it's the, the it's just, yeah, it, the dehumanizing nature just rubs me the wrong way. There was a lot of issues with this system, like for for me. I mean, the first thing is, I think it was quite an American approach, firstly, because it's all based on how smiley you are. And I don't know, I don't think I've smiled since the <laughs> 80s, really. So I think I'd probably be fired in the first week. And I'm not a person who sits in a meeting smiling at everyone. It just doesn't happen. And and I, if that is going to I have to my, say I've listened to the binary time, so. <laughs> <laughs> if that's going to rate my, I had to fake a smile there, sorry. If, I, if, if that's going to rate my kind of score in an organisation I don't know it just doesn't make any sense to me and the, re- the, the, the reason I kind of put it over to maybe Americanisms in, in some respects okay there's a surveillance element but uh, Americanisms because they have things like happiness managers if you put a happiness manager into any organisation in the UK I don't know how long you'd last really <laughs> but um, so I don't know so there's all that side of it and then there's all the transmission of data over and back and I'm not a fan of Microsoft anyway I have to use them for work I'm not happy about it but I have to pay bills um, uh, yeah I don't know I, it wasn't for me And uh, but that said in Office 365 or Microsoft 365 as they're calling it at the moment there's already lots of metrics in the background and you can see how many people viewed your posts you can see kind of there's already metrics that you can go and search for if you want um, without this almost oppressive version what it seems to me is what this new uh, thing that they're rolling back on is it's it's the scary concept of gamification like you go and you open your xbox and there's gonna be you know your score from halo your score from uh cyber uh cyberpunk 27 2077 and mm-hmm. your score from making a spreadsheet like great <laughs> you know, so. oh my god <laughs> i know where i want to be <laughs> yeah. uh that was a nice return to, to the the opening chapter um i think we'll move on to something else shall we um yeah move it move it red <laughs> red hat um unexpectedly announced that they are killing off the free as in beer centos variant of their flagship distribution red hat linux um so yeah um basically they're not technically supporting centos anymore is that what it is I think we need a bit of background on this one. I had to look it up. I didn't know. I'm not a sysadmin. Maybe Mark or uh, Wayne would be able to uh, com- uh, like correct me or go in more in depth on this one, or, or even you guys. I, I don't know. But uh, basically, very fastly, CentOS, obviously, uh, free repackaging, uh, debranding of Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Red Hat bought them in 2014. Uh, they carried on with them. They killed off scientific Linux, which was also similar. Uh, but they 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 kept on going, giving Red Hat uh, sorry, giving CentOS with the same release cycle. Uh, what happened is CentOS 8 released recently was meant to be going till 2029, and a lot of people, by the looks of it, kind of started to rely on on that. Right? Okay, so I'm gonna get CentOS 8 on my production servers, and it's gonna be here for the next 10 years. That's the cycle, and that's what I'm happy with. Right? Suddenly, this week or was it last week? I don't remember. Red Hat says, "Okay, now we are merging this into CentOS Stream, and CentOS Stream is a different beast, apparently." And again, that's what I'm reading from the internet, right? CentOS Stream is, uh, if it's not downstream from RHEL like CentOS was, but it's slightly upstream, so that it's not as far ahead as Fedora, but you would have the sequence of Fedora, CentOS Stream, and Red Hat, and also importantly, whilst Red Hat, uh, you can choose not to do minor upgrades. So from if you are on Red Hat 8, you can stay on Red Hat 8, 8 and you don't have to go to 8.1. This won't be possible with uh, CentOS Stream. And I also think the, um, they will limit 
the amount like they will limit the support they also plan on releasing I, i'm very smart because i listened to the linux unplugged where they had quite a good breakdown of this well uh, you know they, it's it's worth to if it's worth listening to if you're interested in this this case so they will also try to uh, ease the licensing around red hat so that more projects can actually use red hat and make up for centos and like there's obviously big controversy about this. Um, Matthew Miller from the Pedro Project, who's obviously paid by Red Hat, uh, but he's also, we had him on the show, and he's like from all interaction and from all the following on Twitter. And uh, whatever he said, I can, I feel like he's a trustworthy guy. He's uh, maintaining that uh, this is all good, uh, you know, that uh, it's, it's, it's a change for good because. And this is not necessarily his words, but also somewhere I read that basically Red Hat had a problem with getting CentOS, uh, getting uh, community collaboration on CentOS because it's basically free Red Hat. So people will, or free RHEL, people will basically just take it, but there is no community interaction in that. There is no building it as an open source project. So making, putting it into CentOS stream, they can hope to build community around that. And uh, also, uh, they 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 feel like maybe it's not such a, such a big problem for people to go back to stream uh on the other hand there's a lot of uh, very uh, disrupted sysadmins uh, who you know rely on red hat so that's basically my background am i am i kind of in the right ballpark with this absolutely i mean you pretty much described it there i think uh, but i i don't i don't really i don't really understand why they're doing this you know, because, you know, you had CentOS had a good use case in that, you know, you could spin up CentOS, throw an application on it, do your testing, and then put it into production and just get rid of that, right? You can't do that anymore because you wouldn't be testing like on like because your CentOS is now upstream of your enterprise version. You know, and why why have two upstream versions you mean fedora and centos stream yeah i i don't really get it i i i do kind of see the point like i see fedora always i know that's not the case as much but i always seen it as completely separate from rel because uh the only interaction i had with centos was when we used it in maplin as a basically desktop operating system on on and and the epos ran centos and it was really bad and it was like 10 also like you know there were other problems with with the whole organization so the centos uh, install was really bad and the hardware was really rubbish and everything but uh if you compare if you compare to me if you compare centos and fedora those are two completely different projects at least on the face of it but then again deep inside maybe not yeah you know, like fedora i suppose is your bleeding edge and the good bits get taken out of that and put into your enterprise version but uh, i don't know maybe there is a case to have a kind of a, a testing platform for fedora before it reaches like you know whatever they get in fedora whatever reaches enterprise linux have some version in between i don't know well maybe if you if you were setting it up right from from this point if you didn't have uh, 20 years or what of red hat restory or even more than 20 years probably um if you didn't have that, if you were trying to set up a company like this and had uh, two offerings uh, that are uh, open source and for free, as in money, and one of them is this, and and then you had like your super money making uh, enterprise server server uh, edition. I think the way they did it. Like the way they are trying to position it right now would be probably how you could set it up to make a reasonable kind of chain of on events. So you'd have the, you would have the hobbyist base uh, and workstation base uh, desktop distro that is just speeding ahead, you know, towards uh, uh, towards uh, you know progress and evolution. But then you would need to have some kind of a test bed for your uh, big enterprise one as well. And since that's not exactly, it since it is open source, but it's not exactly, as far as I understand, it's not that kind of open source project, right? It's not like people don't go in troves to contribute to Red Hat, Red Hat to Rel, unless or, or do they? Like, does that happen? You know, the same way there's a lot of volunteers working on Debian. Would that be the same for Red Hat? Yeah, yeah, good points. Be good, good reason to get uh, Mr. Miller back onto the show. 
I, I don't know if he's the right one uh, for for this. this he's, a, he's a Fedora guy, so maybe someone from... Yeah, maybe we should get somebody from Red Hat if they've had time. Are they based in Dublin at all? I know IBM is, but Red Hat, I don't know. Yeah, IBM is... I think Red Hat do have offices. They around, had an yeah. office in in Dublin. I don't know, is it still around? I'm not sure. But it goes back to that your Microsoft argument there, Mike, where you said once a company owns a product, they can do what they want with it. And they're just yeah, doing what yeah. they want with this to do what they see is best for their, I, I guess, bottom bottom line, which is uh, finance, you know. So um, I, I, I see just another company doing what they want. But however, just before this show, actually, I thought I better do a bit of swatting up on this project. And I ended up watching a guy on YouTube because obviously that's the, the source of all knowledge um, <laughs> on a guy called Jay LeCrow, a Crocs. I'm not too sure. And he has he has the Learn Linux TV channel and he was chatting about this and he said he builds his infrastructure. Now he's a, got he's got a home home lab and running a lot of services and stuff like that. But because he said he said in this, if if Ubuntu made a change, he mainly runs Pop! OS and Ubuntu servers. If Ubuntu made a change overnight that he did not like, he has Ansible script set up for his entire setup to move it to another distro that can do the job. And he said, as as programmers, as developers, and maybe not programmers, as developers and as sysadmins, that you need to be ready for this, especially in the Linux space, because people are kind of projects will do what they want and you might not always yeah. like what they what they do. So you need to be prepared to make a move if you need to. And Ansible was his answer to that. On on that vein, isn't it um, one of the co-founders of uh, the CentOS project? has come up with uh, his own thing now it's at the moment it's it's just oh, yeah, it's, it's it. yeah it's a static page saying uh this is what we intend to do we don't have any isos for you to download uh just yet kind of watch this space uh he's calling it uh rocky linux <laughs> i don't know where he got the name from maybe he's like hey you wait we're gonna make a linux distribution yeah. anyway <laughs> that was my ter- terrible sylvester sloan impression but anyway i understand that is the beauty of it right you can you don't like it fork it it's fine people that's how centos came to being anyway didn't it uh, so so uh, it's I don't know, and as as you uh, said, Vane, it's it's in the end that's a company that does whatever they want. They unlike unlike with Rel, where there's obviously guarantees in place and agreements and signed contracts and stuff, everything, and assurances. There's no such thing with CentOS. You you know, and a lot of people based. I I, I remember 2010. I was using like a website hosting that ran in the backend CentOS service. So there's a lot of business built on it. And uh, a lot of people are quite surprised now, I'd imagine. I, I shouldn't be, I, it's not a laughing matter because, you know, but it does remind us that uh, it's not, there is no, this is open source and this is community. There is no, nobody owes us the kind of uh, assurances that this should be here tomorrow. That's the beauty of open source is also, if I run a project uh, and I don't like to, to do it tomorrow, I can just drop it and, and be off with it. Obviously, then you have to kind of also take into the account that the community gave you something, so you should probably be giving something back. So, and I think Red Hat, as f- at least in their words for now, because you know that's new. So, so in in their words now, they are still they are tra- they want they say they want to increase community engagement in uh, CentOS Stream. Or oh, CentOS Stream is the way to increase community engagement in their server offerings, so that. Uh, you know, they, they should not also, like, obviously they are a company who can do whatever, but also they should remember that they are building this on community efforts, also on Linux Foundation's efforts and everybody else's efforts. But it's it's a complex web of things, and uh, I, you know, eventually this whole thing will kind of settle down, the, 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 the heartbeats will slow down and uh, the rage will subside, and then maybe something constructive will come out of it. And if, if they really mess it up, I mean, there are many other distributions. Again, beauty of open source. There's a, oh something else I noticed there. Um, there's a new Raspberry Pi OS release this month. Um, Wayne provided that bit of news. Um, I was actually just reading up on some of the changes they've made. Um, just kind of very uh, routine things generally, like they updated Chromium eighty four. I think this is on Raspbian, I, I believe, right? Yeah, it's Raspberry Pi OS now, is what they call it. Um, oh, I see. 
but but okay. actually that update of chromium was quite significant because they did an awful lot of apparently it has improved the um the the quality of video playback on sites like youtube has been you know massively improved so i don't know if any of you guys ever tried using a pi as a daily driver it's something i always meant to do but never had the never had the cajones to do it yeah. um you won't do it for and, long <laughs> Yeah, exactly. But it is they they seem to be refining and refining and and I don't know it it, it seems to be continually getting better and of course they've made Pulse Audio the main audio sound server now and um and I don't know and printing has improved and uh what else I'm just trying to to trying to swipe down there to see where what else ex levels of access accessibility and why not you know including Orca and um uh, and new hardware options. I, I just feel like a bit of not that it didn't, not that work didn't go into the previous editions, but I feel like some significant work has gone into this. And um, just making the overall user end user experience because it's easy to buy a Pi, put it in, plug it in, and go. Oh my, YouTube's jittery, and uh, it's not behave. It's not as quick as I'd like. But we're all used to sitting in front of a desktop computer, and it's not a desktop computer. But it's just trying to be a low end desktop computer, and I think this is a good step towards um, what it can, and only more of what it will be in the future. Well, they put it into the nice keyboard, didn't they? The, the one that uh, kind of resembles the home mini computers of the 80s, or, you know, the uh, event. If you think about it back then, obviously I wasn't, uh, well, I was very little. But uh, and uh, but if you, if you, back then, if you just gave this to children, then all you probably need to give them was like a basic with it and some, and some games so that they can program and play. Now you give them something like that. They do expect it to play Minecraft. They do expect it to play YouTube. They do expect to be able to use it to connect to their friends, you know, and all of these things need powerful processors. So I, I'd imagine maybe the, the, the Raspberry Pi 4 with, I don't know, is it 4 or 8 gigabytes of RAM? That might be getting there. But, uh, like, I, I don't know. I tried. Obviously, I, I messed around. I've got a 3 and a 2, and I messed around with them, but I wouldn't be able to use it as a daily driver. No. But actually, have any of you seen the the new hackboard on uh, Crowd Supply? Well, basically, you're getting a, an Intel Celeron uh, processor, and it's kind of coming in. I think the, the basic price comes in around uh, $99 or whatever. And it's trying to be another Raspberry Pi competitor, but uh, it looks really nice, you know. I think it's four gig of RAM. Didn't Intel do something like this with the Galileo platform that I think no longer exists? That's right. Yeah, yeah. That was very much a developer board, though, wasn't it? In your last episode, actually, you were talking about uh, um, Mark. You're saying that something that you're running that completely. Uh, ran under your radar and you forgot to give it a shout out was um, is it Freedom Box? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Freedom Box. That's another. Yeah. Uh... I know. Literally on the basis of, basis of that, I do not have a Pi, but I do have a, a Rock sixty four, not the Pro, just the the regular one. And I saw that they have images for that, so I might actually oh, nice. give that um. Uh, uh, a go on my uh, over the Christmas break and that got me thinking of various things that we could that you, people use Raspberry Pis for that we could kind of give a shout out for um, you're, uh, also you were, you were saying that uh, uh, was it either yourself Mark or Wayne was saying that there um, there is pre uh, pre-configured uh, an easy way on Ubuntu on the Pi to get uh, Nextcloud up and running yeah. uh, then that reminded me immediately once you said that of Nextcloud Pi I don't know if you're familiar with it um, so uh, some and that got me thinking of other things that I would like to give a, sh a shout out that you can run on your Pi uh, Libra Lec which is kind of just a Cody box that you can run on your Pi uh, Retro Pi of course uh, uh, Laka, which is kind of like RetroPie, where it's um, emulators, but it's it's pre set up and it has a nice GUI. Um, if you're familiar with the PlayStation Three UI, the cross media bar UI, then and that's the great thing with the the Pi. I think there's just such a big community around it. 
I'll quickly quickly run out the list was probably the the last one but probably the one of the more interesting ones is Pi KVM where this guy is actually said you could kind of turn your 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 Raspberry Pi into a KVM. Yeah, like I'm even learning about some of these for the first time. Like Laka looks looks incredible. I I never knew about this. God, and I I even have a little Pi. I have the little Sega Mega Drive case for the Pi as well. Yeah, yeah, so I have, here. I have s- several Raspberry Pis that are doing nothing right now, so <laughs> I have lots of options. Yeah, I'd say you're not alone there, Shane. <laughs> <laughs> I have a box just filled, but I think there's four Raspberry Pis in there, one from each generation, and oh, there's one underneath the telly. Yeah, it's got that uh that that cool um Sega Mega Drive case, but it has a, a reset button and everything. Like it's brilliant. But that's where I think that hackboard could give the Raspberry Pi for a run for its money. Because what's great about the Raspberry Pi is all the projects. There's such a huge community behind the Raspberry Pi. And there's just so many projects being created for it and being developed and everything. But with this hackboard, it's using an Intel Celeron processor, 8 gig of RAM, or 4 or 8 gig of RAM. Uh, and I think it's an NVMe um, slot or something in it. You know, I, like that's a serious bit of computing and you've got the entire Intel ecosystem behind us ready and waiting. That, that could be the the little kind of, I wanted to like a little dumb NAS just sitting somewhere in the house, uh, not doing much, just just so I could have my files sitting on that. And so it doesn't matter if I'm sitting at the computer or on the laptop in the living room, I can still access the same files. Yeah. That could be a good use case for it. Yeah. Or it could easily run popcorn time. I'm just saying it for a friend. (laughs) (laughs) Based on what you were saying there, Shane, about uses again for the Raspberry Pi, I mean, something I've been kind of playing with recently, and I might have even mentioned this on on our last shows and stuff, was um, just putting Ubuntu server on the Pi and running Docker on it and and, and throwing up a few Docker images. And um, I I played around with putting sync thing as a Docker image on the on the Pi and just having a a big disk sitting off that that will sync to any machine. Like I have two laptops and a desktop and no matter what machine I turn on, it's all synced to the same. It's the same home directory I get every time. And, And that's that's been incredibly useful because I might edit some audio here in the sort of home office area. And I might just want to sit in front of the TV and, uh, and and finish it off. And I can do that once I kind of open the machine and there everything's immediately synced down. I don't know. There's lots of potential there. Yeah. Uh, of course, a lot of it comes down to time and aptitude for it and whether you can get a head, your head around all these technologies. I struggle with that sometimes and just the amount of um, think power that they need. And, and But often once these things, once you kind of work them out or spend a bit of time with them, you can you will get there, you know. Um, just as Wayne was talking about um, the idea of being at your PC and then moving over to the TV and kind of um, the portability of nature of it um, reminded me that you can get um, Steam Link for the Raspberry Pi now as well. Oh yeah, yeah, nice one. I I tried it. Um, it's 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 need, it needs a bit of work. Um, to be honest. Um, now I'm not ruling out local issues, but. Uh, if you have a Linux host for the game and a Linux client, I've heard other people say that it doesn't work fantastically either. Um, a few little issues like uh, it could, other people have probably got it working no problem, so I'm not trying to discourage anyone from trying it. But um, yeah, on Pop OS I was using, I had I had a bit of I had a few issues. It wouldn't it never worked perfectly for me. I know Mark from Ubuntu uh, Ubuntu podcast. Is it Mark? Um... Yeah, Mark. Mark, yeah, sorry, I got confused because I, I couldn't... Oh, yeah, it was Mark, yeah, sorry, I was thinking. Uh, I think it was uh, a reason why I was going to... Cr- thought you were thinking about it because Martin was saying that uh, I think you can get it on the Ubuntu Mate on the Raspberry Pi now as well. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because that would be very handy for me. That would be brilliant. That means I could, I could play my games in the living room from my PC. Like, that would be fantastic. And I've got a Steam controller and an Xbox 360 or an Xbox One wireless controller. And I ha- I got the Linux uh, drivers for it working and everything. So nice, <laughs> nice. The, the, the last piece of the puzzle is Steam Link. Just based, just one last comment there on what, on what Connor was saying about Mate on the Pi. I've actually tested it even on the SD card. It is it is pretty zippy. Now, I do have an 8 gig uh, sort of Pi 4, etc. But um 
back to this daily driver question on a pie it really was pretty close it was pretty close I think I think it's it's on the cusp of getting there because uh, Ubuntu now has images. I mean, I know um, Martin Wimpress was doing his own kind of hackery around getting um, Ubuntu Mate on the Pi. It wasn't an official thing, but now I think there's official uh, Ubuntu images coming out for the Pi. Yeah. Um. So with the with the GNOME three interface and everything like that, uh, coming out on the Pi. Uh. I think uh, Manjaro has uh, images for the Pi um, running uh, KDE uh, as well. And so it's all very interesting. So who knows? And combine everything you're saying there with the ability to boot from SSD or an NVMe hat. And, you know, where, where, where you know, that's data throughput that's m- more than handleable, even for us. Mark, I see you ha- you put in an event there. Um the holiday hack challenge yeah it was something i only came across a, a day or two ago um it's the the 2020 sans uh, holiday hack challenge so you know if you're at a loose end over the well not that i was gonna say christmas but over the holidays uh you know you could uh, have some fun with that so uh yeah th- i think that's uh that's almost it it from us um if you want to uh buy a t-shirt or a mug um you can go to linuxlads.com forward slash store um you can get us on telegram it's Linux great for the holiday forward season <laughs> <laughs> linuxlads.com forward slash telegram 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 uh forward slash mastodon uh, at linuxlads on twitter uh, you can also get us on Steam, the Steam community as well. Um, and if you shout us out in the Telegram group, we can add you to our Linux gaming chat as well, where we coordinate playing games on Telegram. I'm a member in the Steam community. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's the Telegram chat is mainly where we're most active. But of course, if you're a member of the community, you can see when other people, other members of the community are, are playing and what uh, what games they're playing and that's it yeah because i'm not on steam that much but when i am i am looking at my friends list i'm kind of going oh who's online you know i i think it will be cool to have an ad hoc game here and there especially over christmas i'll I'll have a lot more free time just sitting around doing nothing so um <laughs> um if you would like to uh email the show you can do that show at linuxlads.com um you can also donate without buying a t-shirt or a mug but we'd recommend the first one because you get something in return as well linuxlads.com forward slash donate um, if you want to ask us any questions, fire away. Let us know how shite we are. Whatever. I just want to take this opportunity, lads, to say thanks very much for having us back on the show again for this second year running. I, I think I might have missed my opportunity. You gave me that opportunity about five minutes ago, Shane, and I've totally messed it up. Um, but thanks very much for having us, and it's nice to chat with you all again. Yeah, for sure. Really appreciate Mark and Wayne coming on the show again. Um, it's always good to represent the Irish Linux podcasters. Go on, the lads. <laughs> that about wraps it up from us. Um, I've been Shane. I've been Connor. I've been Mike. I've been Wayne. And I've been Mark. Nobody interrupted anyone. That was brilliant. <laughs> right. Goodbye. Bye. 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 Bye.